Uh, thank you for allowing me to come again and preach. Um, it's an exciting time for us. Uh, the baby's name will be Leah Jane Miller. She's due in June. We're very excited. Uh, please be praying for us as we prepare for that um, and all the things that go along with that as we're praying for you in this church. Um, before we get into it, let us pray. Let's pray. May your name be like honey on our lips. May your spirit be like water to our soul. May your word be a lamp unto our feet. God, may the meditations of all our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you. I pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. That's where we are. And we're going to read it again. We're going to read it again. Um, I'm in the NASB. I sort of transition between the ESV and the NASB throughout, but mostly the NASB is what I'll use. Just for your information, we're starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, invisible, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The supremacy of Christ. Uh, the year was 115 AD, and there was an 86 year old man sitting in the dining room of his house as he heard knocks on the door. And he went to the door to find out who it was, and it was several Roman soldiers, fully armored, fully armed to take him away to be executed. Uh, many sources say that he actually invited them in to offer them refreshments. But this man was Polycarp. And uh, he was well known to be antagonistic to the Roman government simply because they constantly persecuted Christians. And not only that, but he would preach the gospel boldly on the streets. No matter the kind of tension, political tension that might be around, he would preach the gospel anyway. He was known for being bold. Uh, he's one of the, what people call the apostolic fathers, those that came after the apostles. In a time of intense persecution, uh, these apostolic fathers carried true doctrine, correct doctrine, and the gospel through a time of intense persecution and a time when a lot of heresy was going on, a lot, a lot of false teaching, and he was among those apostolic fathers. And one of my favorite stories about Polycarp um, he's being tried in front of Caesar and there's hundreds of Romans there many Romans there and he's being tried for treason because he's speaking against the Roman government and actually he's also being accused of being an atheist and then you think well that's odd he's a Christian why would he be accused of being an atheist uh, but in a Roman society an ancient Roman society um, they believed in a pantheon of gods so, so a person that believes in one God and in fact a God that they can't see it doesn't make sense to them so he, he was being accused of, of treason and of atheism. And in front of Caesar and hundreds of, of, of Roman citizens, he points to the crowd and he says, there are your atheists. As if to boldly declare that he is the only one present that believes in the one true God. It would be an understatement to say that Polycarp uh, lived a bold life for God, lived a, a big life, did big things for Christ. That would be an understatement. But Why? Why did he do that? Why would he risk everything? Sacrifice ultimately his life. He was martyred for the faith. I think the answer can be found in a letter he wrote in a response to the church at Philippi. They said, why don't you just drop it? Just don't worry about it anymore. Listen, they're going to kill you. All right? Just, just, drop, just, just say that you're not affiliated with the church. Just don't worry about it. He responded uh, like this. 86 years... I have followed Christ, and He has done me no harm. How can I betray my Savior and my King? See, Polycarp did big things for Christ because he had a big view of who Christ is. He lived in the reality of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. 
And in our passage today, Paul's argument is clear. Christ is supreme and above all else. But the question that should be rushing in the back of our minds as we read his arguments is, is he supreme in my life? That is, is Christ above all else in my life? The supremacy of Christ in our lives will affect the way that we live, just like it did Polycarp. In the Colossian church at the time, there was a heresy that was creeping in, and it was Gnosticism. And Gnosticism taught that faith alone in Jesus Christ, that wasn't enough. Uh, There was also a certain hidden knowledge that you needed in order to gain salvation. And it wasn't really something that rivaled Christ. Instead, it was something that was taught alongside Christ, as if to say that Jesus was not enough. But more than that, Gnosticism also taught that the body was 100% evil in everything. Therefore, it doesn't make sense that God would become a man. Uh, So Gnosticism challenged the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. And this, of course, was a huge issue. And Paul directly addresses it. The first two verses are simply introduction. And after that, until we get to verse 15, he thanks the church for, for some of the faithfulness that they do have. But the meat of the passage really begins in verse 15. And he gets straight into it, discussing the supremacy of Christ. Uh, There are two primary arguments that he makes, that Paul makes here. The first is that Christ is supreme over all creation. And the second is Christ is supreme over the church. So the first argument is that Christ is supreme over all creation. And the second is that Christ is supreme over the church. So we'll begin in verse 15. There are three reasons uh, that Paul gives that Christ is supreme over the church. Three reasons he gives. And the first is that he is divine. Not over the church, over creation. He is divine. The second is he is creator. And the third is he sustains his creation. So Paul argues that Christ is supreme over all creation because he is divine, he is creator, and he sustains his creation. Uh, He begins this portion by saying he is the image of the invisible God. Uh, It's very consistent in Scripture that God is invisible. It's a consistent teaching. John chapter 5 verse 37 says, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice or at any time seen him. 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 says, Now the King eternal, immortal, invisible the only God. And in Exodus 33, verse 20, uh, God says, you cannot see my face. However, Jesus here is the image of the invisible God. I think Paul picks his terms intentionally. Here the term image is icon in the Greek and means exact representation. Jesus is the exact representation of God. Paul is saying that what was once invisible is now visible, fully seen, in the person of Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus says to Philip in John chapter 14, Have I not been with you so long? Because Philip and others in the the upper room, they say, You talk about the Father all the time, but just show us the Father. And he says, You're asking an elementary question on graduation day. Have I not been with you for so long, you still don't know me? If you've seen me, You've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is God visible. John starts his gospel with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was anything, was not anything made that was made. And in John chapter 8, 58, we know this. This is so famous. This is popular verse. Jesus says to the Pharisees that are curious How such a young person, you're barely 30, how can you intimately know who Abraham is? It just doesn't make sense. And he says, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Intentionally breaking uh, breaking grammatical consistency to make a point. Before Abraham was, I am. And then John finishes his gospel towards the end with the scene of Thomas and Jesus. 
Thomas feeling the wounds of Jesus and finally coming to the realization of who he is, looks up at him and says, My Lord and my God. It's consistent in the book of John and it's consistent in all of Scripture. Jesus is God in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. And He upholds all things by the word of His power. That, that word, that term, exact representation, the same as what Paul uses in Colossians. Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. What was once invisible can now be fully seen in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the image of God. And then you think, I've heard this, this phrase before, image. We're made in the image of God. There's an important distinction to make. Christ is the image of God. We were created in His image. Christ is the image. The manifestation, the exact representation of God. He came as 100% human, but is 100% divine. And is God manifested to us. Jesus being anything less than divine is against the teachings of Scripture and the teachings of Jesus Himself. I get the question sometimes in the classroom, because uh, we talk about the divinity of Jesus Christ, because I know that Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they, they're, they're around, and sometimes they get in conversations with our students, um, because they've told me stories about their confrontations with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, so we, we, we discuss different arguments and defenses of the faith, and they ask the question, why does this matter that Jesus is divine? Why does it matter? Uh, can't he just be a human uh, and take all our sins away? Um, the answer is no. He must be divine. And thanks be to God that he is. It matters because by the power of his divinity, he might bear the weight of God's anger in his humanity and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Last week we learned about God's righteousness and how His righteousness has been imputed to us. We cannot save ourselves. There is no way any mere human could bear and fully satisfy God's wrath. By nature, this wrath is infinite in quality. In order to bear the weight of wrath, it is essential that the Savior be divine. But also, in order to satisfy this wrath, He had to offer a sacrifice of such a value that God would be pleased to accept it. Only Christ as God could bring a sacrifice of infinite and eternal value to God that He would propitiate or satisfy heaven's wrath. By virtue of His divine nature, He is able to earn for us eternal life and favor with God. The divinity of Christ means that He is able to be raised from the dead and conquer death and therefore apply the benefits he has earned for us. Uh, this is not an insignificant teaching. This is not a doctrine that you can just blow over. It's fine if they don't believe it. This is crucial to your salvation. Jesus Christ is God. He is Lord of all. So Paul says here that he is supreme over all creation because number one, he created it. He says here that he is the firstborn of all creation. And then you think, well, that sounds like he has a beginning. That's exactly what the Jehovah's Witness would say. But if you take the word firstborn completely literally, the first to be born would be Cain. But no, Jesus is not the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn has been used before. I'm going to go over two instances. And the first being in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Uh, God says to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Uh, it doesn't mean that Israel is the first to be created in chronological order or in time sequence. Uh, but instead, Israel has been set apart, has certain divine favor apart from the other nations of the world. Israel is exalted in the sight of God. And again, in Psalm chapter 89, verse 27... This one is magnificently clear. God says to David, of David, I will make him my firstborn. Well, David's not the firstborn. He's the youngest. What are you saying, God? He actually explains it in the rest of the verse. He says, I will make him my firstborn 
the highest of the kings of the earth. Firstborn here clearly means an exalted status. David, not the first in order of his brothers. In fact, he's the youngest. And the second half of the verse tells us what firstborn actually means. Highest of the kings of the earth. After we read a few instances of how firstborn is used uh, in Scripture, and then we read the context in which Paul is writing, he's writing about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. It only makes sense when he says firstborn. He means that Jesus is supreme. He is exalted over all creation. And actually verse 16 explains verse 15 further. Verse 16 says, For by Him all things were created. Jesus is supreme over creation because He made it. There's nothing that we can walk by naturally and say Jesus did not create it. There's nothing He can't claim because He made it. Not just the physical world, but the spiritual world. He says here, the visible and the invisible. Things in the heavens and on earth. Jesus created it all. He is supreme and exalted above all creation because He created it. He put leaders in place and is supreme over the most powerful and prominent rulers of the world. He created them. Also note that Jesus created all things. Um, The Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation, says all other things. But in the Greek, it simply isn't there. Jesus created all things. Not all other things except Him, but all things. Paul continues. All things were created through Him and for Him. All things were created through Him and for Him. Not only were all things created through Christ meaning He is the source. But all things were created for Christ, meaning that He is its purpose. If you wanted to, you could put your name in there where it says all things. We were created through Christ and for Christ. He is our purpose. The world wants us to believe that our purpose is found in pleasure, riches, and self-gain. These things promise lasting satisfaction. But the truth is we were not made for those things. We were made to glorify Christ in all we do. Because we were made for Christ, when everything in our lives is centered around Him, there's no better place to be. doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, Scripture promises difficulty. But there is contentment, joy, peace, and satisfaction living for Jesus Christ. And so as you read Paul's arguments here, the question that should be burning in the back of your mind is, am I living for this supreme Christ in everything I do say, think, and feel? So Paul says here that Jesus Christ is supreme over all creation because one, He is divine, and two, He created it. And he moves on. He says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Again, Jehovah's Witnesses want to change the translation and include other. It isn't there. Christ is eternal and has been holding all things together since the beginning of time. Not only did Christ create all things, but He sustains all things. What a beautiful and humbling reality. There is not a second that goes by that we can rightfully say, I did this or I did that without the strength of Christ. He is holding you together. When you rise in the morning, He sustains you through the night. As you commute to work or walk to class, He provided the means. If things aren't going well and tragedy comes, He is still putting air in your lungs and is present with you in hard times. There isn't a minute that goes by that we can say, I did this apart from the grace and love of Christ Jesus. He's holding all of us together. May we never allow pride or arrogance characterize our lives because we know that without Christ, we're nothing and can do nothing. 
And every success of life, every past class, every completed assignment, every new job, every pay raise, instead of considering yourself better than someone else, these things should bring us to our knees in gratitude for Jesus Christ. In every failure and tragedy, we should be reminded that Jesus is active in holding us together. He is with us and truly knows how we feel. He can empathize with us and helps us during the dark times of life. He is active in holding us together. Christ is supreme over all creation because one, He is divine. Two, He created it. And three, He sustains it. He holds all things together. So the first argument that Paul makes is that Jesus is supreme over all creation. The second argument that Paul makes is that He is supreme over the church over the body of the church. And I think for two reasons. Two reasons uh, Paul says Christ is supreme over the church. The first is that Christ is the foundation of the church. And the second is that Christ is the purpose of the church. Christ is the foundation of the church and He is the purpose of the church. Paul says here, He is the head of the body, the church. Uh, the body is used elsewhere in Scripture to describe the church, uh, meaning that there are different parts working together to, to help it live and sustain itself to function properly. But here I think uh, the word body is used in relation to the head. As in the body doesn't survive without the head. Uh, there, was a, um, there is a prominent pastor theologian uh, who said it like this, without a head, uh, you're dead. But more than one head, you're a monster. Uh, sometimes we may be tempted to elevate leaders in the church to a headship where only Christ belongs. We should be grateful for and respect leaders in the church, but at the end of the day, they and all of us are merely tools used to point others to the supreme head of Christ, of the church, Christ Jesus himself. And without Christ, the church does not survive. That's why if Christ is not being worshipped, if Christ is not being preached, the spiritual life of the church is dead. So He is the foundation of the church. Without Him, the church does not survive. Nowhere to stand. Christ is supreme over the body of the church because one, He is the foundation, and two, He is its purpose. He continues by saying, and He is the beginning. This is Jesus is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. And you say, Levi, I've seen that word before. We just said it. The firstborn from the dead. Again, He uses the term firstborn to simply say He is supreme. Jesus was not the first to rise from the dead. But His death and resurrection is supreme above all other resurrections. Lazarus rose from the dead, but he died again. Jesus rose from the dead and he lives forevermore. Christ's resurrection ma makes and initiates our spiritual resurrection in him. He is supreme in resurrection. And the resurrection is a core doctrine of the Christian faith and of the church. The person and work of Christ Jesus is the foundation of the church and the purpose of of the church and that we are to praise him for what he's done preach about the good news of the resurrection and bring this re message of the resurrection to the world I in my class I, I teach Bible at HIS it's a great time but we, we, we do this thing I teach for about 25 minutes because I'm very short-winded it's very difficult for me to teach a long time anyways and after class after my lecture I ask the class questions and I said, okay, if you get the question right, you get to shoot. And literally, it's hilarious what you can do with a garbage can and a piece of trash. I just put a garbage can right there, and I say, okay, here's a line. That's two points. That's three points, you know, so on, so on, so on. If you get the question right, you get to shoot for points. You get bonus points in my class. It's Bible class. You can have like a million bonus points. Nobody cares. So, so you shoot the first one. You know, it's like two points. You shoot it. And then the, the shot way down there on the other corner is eight points. It's eight-point shot. So everybody's trying to, it's hilarious because, you know, peer pressure, 
it makes so much sense to just shoot the two-point shot. Like, then you just rack up your points. It's hilarious, because the students would just be like, no, eight points, eight points. And the person goes directly to the eight-point shot, never makes it in their life, you know. <laughs> but anyways, finally, this was like the middle of the semester. Uh, Byungju, Byungju goes here, right? He's, he's around HIC, I think. Anyways, uh, 11th grade student. He, he, t he takes a shot, no hesitation, shoots a shot. Nothing but, I was going to say net, there's no net in the trash can. Nothing but bottom of the trash can. He makes it. He gets eight points. I told them before he shot. I said, if he makes it, don't scream. <laughs> there, I shouldn't have even, I should have assumed it was going to happen. I said, don't scream. There are classes in every classroom on this floor. It's going to be so loud. And lo and behold, he makes the shot. It didn't matter what I did. People were running up and down the halls. It was, <laughs> people were screaming, clapping, celebrating. It was insane. But I do this in all my classes. So after class was done, I had students coming in. They, picked, they knew exactly what happened. They just peeked their heads in. They said, who made the shot? <laughs> I was like, how'd you know what we... What? I heard the screaming and the celebration and the, and the rejoicing and the, and the joy. How often do people hear our celebration of what Christ has done for us? <laughs> right. How, how often do they hear our rejoicing? It should be... We should be so engulfed with love for Christ and what He's done that it just overflows in everything we do say, think, and feel, right? Our people come in and saying, hey, what's going on? So Jesus Christ is supreme over all creation because He is divine, He created it, and He sustains creation. And he is supreme over the church because it's his, it's, he is the foundation of the church and he is the purpose of the church. I love how he finishes this, how he ends this section. He says, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So he said, listen, Christ is supreme now today. Christ was supreme when he created all things and Christ will be supreme at the end of time. Christ is eternally supreme. So if you're going to put your hope in something, put your hope in Christ. Because He's not just supreme today, not just supreme then, He's supreme into eternity. He will come to have first place in everything. When every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is eternally supreme. And then He says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Reminding that the Colossian church, reminding the Colossian church, that Jesus is not just another angel, because that's something that they believed in, but much more. Reminding them that His sacrifice is sufficient to satisfy the wrath of God. You don't need Jesus plus something else. It's Jesus. His sacrifice was enough. So Christ is supreme over all creation because He is divine. He created it and He sustains it. He is supreme over the church because He is the church's foundation and the church's purpose. So what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me? And I wrote down just four simple things uh, that we can take away uh, to, to live a more Christ-centered life. Where do we start? Where do we start? I would say, number one, realizing that He is the source of everything. He is your source. I have four words I wrote down here. Well, one is source. Uh, the second is know, uh, to know Christ. And the third is goal. And the fourth is hope. So source, know, goal, and hope. So number one, realizing that He is our source in everything. Uh, number two, taking time to know Jesus. Uh, we were talking about the fruits of the Spirit at school. And I told them that some of us are wondering, oh, why don't I grow in Christ, but we don't even look at Christ? We need to spend time knowing our Savior. And if maybe, I, I, I believe that there's a Bible reading program here, um, but maybe you're, you're not bold enough to even start a Bible program, just start by reading the Gospels. Get to know Jesus Christ. So first, realize He's your source. Second, get Take time to know Jesus Christ. And third, 
realize that He is your goal and purpose. Make Him your goal and purpose in everything you do. And then fourth, I wrote hope. He is our hope not just for eternity and salvation, although that is a glorious reality, but He is our hope for today and that He is present with us. He is not one that cannot empathize with us. He has literally walked in our shoes. He is our hope for today and for eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, Thank you for uh, coming and for um, humbling yourself uh, to be with your creation. Not just to be with your creation, but God, um, to live amongst us. God, to talk with us. God, to ask questions. What a humble God we serve. Powerful, all-powerful, above all things, supreme, yet coming down uh, to be among us. Not just to be among us, but God, to die for us and to defeat death. Uh, May that be what we live for each and every day. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.